Hey guys. All right, good morning. Show of hands. Who in here has ever told a pastor that something in the Bible was stupid and lived to tell about it? Anyone? All right, well, I have, and I am here today to tell you all about it. So, not very long ago, a few months ago, Ryan and I were uh, having a discussion. We were very frustrated and just kind of at a loss um, about some people in our orbit who were truly behaving like the son Joe talked about last week. We were frustrated about it, and I, was, I in particular, was in a whole mood about it. And to calm me down, to give me some perspective, Ryan decides to bring up the story of the prodigal son. And he's like, you just got to remember, like, they're just, they're just like the prodigal son. They're going to come back. It's going to be fine. And I was like, that is a stupid story. <laughs> I hate it. It's stupid. And I've rendered the guy speechless only like three times in his life, but that was one of them. He just looked at me like, what? You, you can't mean that. I'm like, oh, yes, I can. I, I do. And so, this, so I just kept going. And I was like, it's stupid. It's not fair. I'm like, everybody just wants to talk about the prodigal. Nobody wants to talk about the older brother who stood around and did everything right. Everybody wants to focus on the prodigal. Even you, pastor. Pastors get up and that's all they talk about. They just talk about how great it is that this son was horrible and the dad loved him and all everything is good. And like the other son's over here like, bro, like I stayed. I did everything right. Like give me some credit, right? So I went on like this and Ryan, I don't know, to calm me down or shut me up, said, wow, you don't understand grace at all. You're the older brother. And so I walked away, muttering under my breath, yeah, so what? What is so wrong about that? Hand of the heavens, true story. What is so wrong about that? Well, as it turns out, guys, a lot. <laughs> a lot. So today, if you have your physical Bibles, I know there are a few unicorns out there who do. If you do, I really want you to pull them out and turn to Luke chapter 15, but I also want you to grab a pen, and I want you to write in your Bible. I want you to do some editing. I am an editor. I love to edit. So for the love of my copywriting, copy editing heart, I would like you to go to Luke chapter 15, down to where your Bible either says the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son, or simply the lost son, and please add an S to son. Okay? I promise you, Jesus will not mind. Okay? Jesus told the story, but he was not the editor in there writing the subheads. Okay? There are two lost sons in this story, and the reason it drives me nuts is because nobody talks about this. There are two lost sons in this story. Now, if you're using version, you can't do much about this, kind of at the mercy of that. However, you can grab the app, open it up, click on uh, events, more Genesis Church, and you can follow along with everything we are going to dig into today. But before we actually get started, it's important that you know that Ryan was right, okay? He was right to call me out as the older brother in the passage we're gonna look out look at today. Not just because I was acting like him in that moment, but because I've lived a lot of my life acting like him. A lot of it. Um, you know, I'll spare you the details, some I've shared up here before. Um, but I did want you to know that this, this kind of just puts it all in perspective. In high school, I received what was called the Aridi Award before I graduated. Now, the Aridi Award is an honor given to high school students, but only like one, okay? It was my friend John and I, like one boy, one girl. And this award is given to the student that exemplifies virtue, moral character, excellence in all things. And my friend John and I earned it for being the most respectful, inspirational, responsible, justice, Championing morally sound suck ups in the class of 99. 
okay? I went this morning to see if I could bring this award to show you, and I forgot that I don't have it because the award is even better than something I could store in my garage. It is my senior photo up in the office of my high school for all of time. That is where they honor the Aridi Award recipients. So, this happened. And then I went on later after my parents' divorce was final and my little brother's drug addiction was flourishing, I launched myself into a decades-long achievement project where I towed every line, stopping only long enough to scold my parents for enabling their undeserving, wild-living son with free food, free California housing, and free, valuable even then, Chevron gas gift or gas card just to use to buy gas whenever he wanted. While I'm out getting my degree and doing all the things, this was what was going on. And what I didn't know then that I see very clearly now is that during that time, my brother and I were both far from God. My brother out in his in the streets in his sin, and me in my church pew in my striving. Can any of you relate? If you don't think so, we're going to find out here. So let's open up to Luke chapter 15. Now, you'll recall from last week that two groups of people had come to listen to Jesus teach this day. There were the notorious sinners. These were your tax collectors, your prostitutes, your almond milk drinkers, and the like. You know? Sorry, guys. This stuff is nasty. Like Ryan's like on a health kick right now and he's doing awesome and he won't even drink it. So there's that. Anyway, so you've got these notorious sinners, right? And they are known for their sin. And these are the, the, the men and women who abandoned the tra traditions of their families and the Jewish laws at the time to live however they wanted. This group clearly identified easily with the son in the first story, the son who Joe introduced us to last week, where... This kid demands his inheritance instead of waiting for it. He demands it from his father. He goes out and he blows it on wild living. He comes home repentant, fully aware of his need for mercy and grace, which his father then just freely gives him, complete with a feast and a party to celebrate. And so gathered next to these sinners around Jesus were, was another group, and these were the Pharisees, the teachers of religious law, the Pharisees and the Aridi Award winners, right? <laughs> who were, they were in a whole mood about the fact that Jesus would allow this other group of outcasts to even be there, all right? Among other things, they thought this was stupid. They thought this was annoying. They were not having it. And, and it does seem that way if we come to this passage and only focus on the son who leaves and the father who welcomes him home without staying in it long enough to notice that Jesus directs this story more at the good people listening, the Pharisees, than at the bad people, the notorious sinners, right? In truth, the Pharisees' high and mighty attitude that only the keepers of the law and the rule followers should have access to God, and, and this is who Jesus was coming after. He was coming after that attitude, first and foremost. And so we pick it up in Luke 15, verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was out in the fields working. This is when, after the son has come home. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. All right, stop right there. So I don't really see any problem with the older son right now. I mean, he was out in the fields. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was being the dutiful son. And he was just working day after day, right within earshot of his father, while his kid brother was off gambling in Vegas. So surely, like, no resentment was simmering in that squeaky clean pot. Surely not. Verse 28. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. 
Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Not fair, Dad. Not cool. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And Jesus just straight up ends the story right there. With Vegas inside, eating the steak with his dad, and the older son standing outside in the dark alone, walled off from the celebration. Why? Why does he end it here? Well, perhaps to allow the Pharisees some time and some stunned silence to consider what church history professor John Gershner used to say all the time. He used to say that the main thing between you and God is not your sins, but your damnable good works. And if you have a problem with me putting a naughty word in the church building, well... Genesis, what if our good works, not our wrongdoings, are actually keeping us from God? What if our pride in our moral record, not necessarily our shame over our broken track record, is keeping us from fully experiencing that overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God that we just talked about, saying about? And what if our self-imposed distance from the Father as we stand outside is keeping us from him and from each other. So to answer these questions, we need to take a closer look at the older son. And, and this is not easy to do. It wasn't easy for me to do, truly. I up here, and I'm joking, but truly, this was difficult for me to ask these questions and and come to terms with the answers, right? So the three questions we need to ask are, why is he home, the older son? Why is he so angry? And why is he still outside, All right? So first, to see if our good works might be keeping us from God, let's ask, why is he home? So his brother goes and leaves. Did the older son stay home to just enjoy life with his father? Absolutely not. Okay? He stayed home to ensure his inheritance. Because both sons wanted the same thing. Okay? They wanted to both be out from under their father's authority so that they could c control their portion of his wealth. All right? I mean, the younger son, just he just straight up took it. Right? At least he was honest about it. Like He just took it and ran. The older son was a lot sneakier about it. He stayed home. He followed all the rules. He did everything expected of him, not as a way of honoring and serving the father, but as a way of manipulating him into giving him the keys to the Tesla, right? You know, if he just did enough good things, surely the father would be in debt to him and have no choice but to give him the beach house, right? If he just did it all right, the father would have to give him everything. And so neither one of these entitled brats actually cared about their dad. They were just using him to get stuff. The older son's obedience then, it wasn't fueled by love. It was motivated by fear and by self-protection. And the dead giveaway that this is what's going on comes in verse 29 when the older son says to his father, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Did you catch it? All these years I slaved for you. Somewhere in all his maneuvering and do-gooding, he forgot he was a son. He forgot his father was a father, and instead, he made him out to be this demanding slave owner. And this happened because loving and enjoying and serving the father was never his goal. Getting the inheritance was. 
the older son's heart was fixed elsewhere, which essentially positioned him just as far away from the father as the younger son was out in Vegas, even though the older son was literally living in his father's house. And so you know what this means, don't you? It means that we can wander from the father while living within earshot of him. We can be far from God while doing good things right in front of him. We can do it right in this room, guys. And we do. Look at Isaiah 29, verse 13. And so the Lord says, These people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. If we're showing up to church every Sunday, or we're serving on a team, or we're tithing only because we're afraid of the consequences, eternal or otherwise, of not doing those things, we may be farther from God than we think. I mean, y'all, I grew up Catholic. This was our deal, right? (laughs) Everything we did, everything I did as a good Catholic was done out of fear, not joy. Literally, everything was transactional. My dad used to say to me, when I did not want to get up for the 8 a.m. early mass and I wanted to go to the 12 o'clock, he's like, Jesus died for you and you can't give up one hour of your week? I mean, that is how I grew up. Like, okay, guess I better go. This will be fun. And so this kind of attitude, you don't have to grow up Catholic to, to experience this, right? This fear-based compliance can play out in a lot of ways, okay? A couple of them. First of all, think about your prayer life right now. Is it dry right now? Is it robotic? If it's lost its delight, if if it's lost its intimacy, if you heard about that 24-hour prayer thing and you're like, heck no, because there's there's no delight or intimacy in it, if it's lost it, it might be because you're more concerned with controlling your circumstances than you are with coming and spending time with God, right? You know, you might, you're just like putting a quarter, as they say, in the, in the cosmic gumball machine. You're just doing it to try to get something from God instead of to be with him. And so that might be one sign that, that you've kind of got, you know, an elder brother spirit in you. Or maybe you're running yourself ragged doing and buying and striving to appear happier or nicer or more put together than you actually are. You're burdened with making yourself look and be enough to your friends and your family and your coworkers and strangers on the internet, even when, as, as Ruth Cho Simon says, we simply aren't enough, perfect enough, all-knowing enough, good enough, or wise enough to orchestrate the kind of life that won't let us down. We can't do it. Which leads us right into the second question we need to ask of the older brother to see if maybe our pride in our moral record is keeping us from fully experiencing God's love. And that question is, why is he angry? Why is he so angry? Well, the short answer is that he lost control. Despite his striving, his right living, his calculated attempts to control his environment and secure his inheritance through strict obedience, it just wasn't enough. Things didn't go as planned, and he could not deal with it because anger was always simmering just below the surface as he worked to keep that lid, you know, just sealed so tight. As he did all these things, not out of love, but out of fear and selfishness, resentment and rage, they just boil right over and out of him the moment he realizes that his goodness isn't going to pay off. He's not going to get what he deserves, what he thinks he deserves, for being so good. And on top of that, he's not even going to be able to feel fear superior feel superior anymore to his screw-up little brother. He's so irate about this that he will not even claim his brother as his brother. Look back at verse 30. It says, yet is he, 
the older son says to the father, yet when this son of yours, not my brother, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened cow. So now he's not just alienated from the father, he's also alienated himself from his brother. All because, like the Pharisees, he believed that people should only be rewarded for their outward goodness, all the while forgetting that the ground is level at the foot of the cross and that everyone has fallen well short of perfection. Of this, Tim Keller says, if the elder brother had known his own heart, he would have said, I'm just as self-centered and a grief to my father in my own way as my brother is in his. I have no right to feel superior. Then he would have had the freedom to give his brother the same forgiveness that his father did. But the elder brothers do not see themselves in this way. Their anger is a prison of their own making. The older son's sin was buried beneath so many layers of self-control and striving that he just couldn't see how spiritually dead and walled off from the father he actually was. I mean, the younger son, to his credit, he at least knew. He at least knew he messed up and that he needed mercy and grace the older son was so busy being good that he did not realize his heart had gone bad. Instead of taking a closer look at the source of his anger, this dude is out there complaining about cuts of meat, okay? Like, he did not need a steak in that moment. He needed a surgeon. And think about this, like when it comes to our physical health, what is more dangerous, an underlying heart condition we don't know about or one that we do? Right? When it comes to our spiritual life, when religious moralism is junking up our heart, it can be a fatal disease, especially to our relationships. Because we often use this, our rightness and our good works, to mask deeper issues like envy and insecurity and prejudice and hate for people we should not be hating. So before we move on, I'm gonna do us all a little public health service and we're gonna do a little, a little heart check, okay? So one way to tell if religious moralism is junking up your heart is if suffering angers you. Not disappoints you, not surprises you, not scares you, not causes you to feel sadness and sorrow, but if suffering just angers you, suffering of any kind, when you suffer in any way from a mild inconvenience to something as serious as a really major health scare, your go-to response is white hot anger and bitterness. You resent the situation because you feel you don't deserve it. Right? Bad things shouldn't happen to good people. You've been good, so you deserve to be good. You've done X, so you deserve Y. Your good works, or your good grades, or your good looks, or your good credit score should equal a good life, right? But when they don't, trouble, right? When they don't, you resent other people's lives. You resent other people's money, other people's jobs, other people's relationships, other people's success, other people's whatever, because you feel that you deserve it more than they do. So if suffering really angers you, this might be a sign that you've got this, this elder brother spirit in you. Another sign that religious moralism might be junking up your heart a little bit is that if, if you have a strong sense of superiority, this this is it for me, you guys. <laughs> this has long been my Achilles heel. The more I do right in my work, in my parenting, in my marriage, in my daily routines, the more I feel like I'm in a position to judge others for not doing things the way I would do them or for doing them wrong. Like so much so that I had like a bunch of examples I was gonna give you of this. But it wasn't just examples to like tell you like, oh, do you do this? 
it was actually going to be like a passive aggressive way of showing you like, oh, this is actually how I would do it. Like this is how I would walk my kid through Target. I wouldn't let them walk. That sort of thing, right? Like I, and so I'm like, I cannot do that because God is working on me. <laughs> I'm not going to do that because that's not, we're not here to point out how much better we are than everybody because we're not, right? So if you often find yourselves, like I do, looking at others and saying, oh, I'd never do that, I'd never do that, I'd never do it that way, wouldn't do it with that person, mm -mm, would not. Or, this is another one for me, you are overly sensitive to criticism, yet quick to condemn people who don't think or behave or look or act or vote like you, then your pride and your moral record might be keeping you from loving the people God has put around you. And this superiority, this superiority complex could also be keeping you from receiving the fullness of God's grace because you've apparently figured out how to be your own savior. You've figured out how to be your own savior by amassing a bunch of good works that in the end cannot save you. Which brings us to the last question we must ask of the older son. And this one is to see if our distance from the Father is self-imposed. If our distance is something we're just straight up choosing. We need to ask, why is he still outside? Party's going on. The good steak he wants is in there. And he's outside in the dark. Like, literally in the dark. They did not have electricity in the first century. <laughs> he's just out there. He, he wouldn't go inside because to go inside would mean that he would have to let go of all comparison, resentment, and pride in his dutiful towing of every traditional and cultural line. He'd have to surrender to the Father's love, to the Father's way, and to the Father's grace, not only for him, but for his brother. You know, he'd have to walk inside. Think about this. He'd have to walk inside and give honor to his father and to his brother without receiving honor for himself and for what he had done have to walk in there and give honor without receiving credit. That's hard. To truly enjoy the feast, he'd have to make his father's heart, not his inheritance or his goodness, the goal. He'd have to, in effect, give up trying to be his own savior. Now, sulking outside in the dark, he's blind to all of this. And his father, because he knows his kid, knows he's got to go and, and go out there. He's got to go do for the older son what he did for the younger son. And so he does. He disgraces himself, the father does, to go after the older son. Just like last week, Joe talked about how no Jewish man would have humiliated himself by physically running to the city gates. No respectable host in the first century would ever be caught leaving a party to bring somebody in. I mean, do you guys watch Bridgerton? That queen, she is not going to like leave her ball to go bring in a guest. That just did not happen. And to do so would have been humiliating for the father. And yet, he does it. He does it. Look at verse 28. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. He begged him. The father leaves the party and goes outside to plead with his son to understand how much he is loved, not because of his good works, but in spite of them. Jesus shows the Pharisees as he's talking to them through this story and us that we don't just need amazing grace or saving grace. We need initiating grace. Grace that runs to us, throws its arms around us, and even pleads with us 
to get out of our own way so that we can find our way home. To the Father and to each other. In the Father's pursuit of the older son, Jesus makes it clear to the Pharisees that even the most religious, morally upright, excellent people still need God's grace. They, the outwardly spotless, are just as lost as the overtly sinful. The lost, the spotless, or the, the, the spotless and the sinful are equally in need of grace. And the Father, he's going to disgrace himself again and again and again, whether by running, pleading, or hanging on a cross to ensure they all, all receive an invitation to draw near to his love. I want to close today with one more sibling story that God brought to my mind as I was studying for this message. As a lot of you know, because I think I've talked about it up here before, um, in 2017, my dad was diagnosed with um, inoperable pancreatic cancer. And he was living in San Diego at the time. I was obviously here. Uh, my younger brother, Austin, was up in Bend, Oregon. And so Austin and I spent, gosh, the better part of a year uh, working together to, to care for my dad. So we would commute. I was commuting once a month from Phoenix, my brother from Bend. And we were in near daily contact trying to help my dad through chemo and radiation and his eventual send off to heaven. And during that time, we had to work together within our own strength. So I was really good at making doctors tell me things. <laughs> I was really good at getting answers and plowing through red tape and dealing with insurance and just handling the nuts and bolts of stuff. My brother was a lot better relationally with my dad. He had spent a lot more time with my dad and they just had you know, a better relationship. And also, like my brother knew where to find marijuana and he like knew things that were going to help my dad in a way that I was like, whoa. <laughs> Okay, I'm like, you did what? You hid what in his house in case he needed it? Like, not legally, though you can do that now. But like, I was like, okay, I need your help. And, and, and this is just how God used this stuff. Even at the end of my dad's life, I was like super confused by like, okay, how is this gonna go? And my brother's like, listen, I can tell you what morphine does to your body. I can tell you what all these different, you know, anti-anxiety meds will do to him to help him. And it like brought me so much comfort that my brother, who had once had a prescription drug addiction, was now teaching me about prescription drugs to bring me peace and to bring comfort, like, and, and to take me outside when he recognized I was having a panic attack because he'd had a million of those. He's like, you need some help. Like, it was just this really wonderful, weird way that God brought us together to, to help my dad. And so the super sad part of the story is that we lost our dad. But for me, the sweet part of the story is that I got my brother back. And when we were at my dad's memorial, my brother said something that I did not see coming. He, he got up there and he started talking about how my dad just loved bringing people together, whether it was to grill or to have a fancy meal or to go watch a sunset or even to like open his home to any number of the notorious sinners in my brother's lives who needed a place to sober up for a night or for a season. My dad loved doing that. And so at his service, my brother was telling me these stories that I just never thought of my dad in that way because honestly, I was not paying attention to my dad. I just wasn't paying attention to him. And I didn't know any of the, the, any of this stuff. And then my brother said that the last act, he was just, such a beautiful observation. He said, the last act of my dad's life was bringing his kids together. And I was like, oh, he is so right. And why didn't I think of that? <laughs> but he was so right. Like, that is seriously what happened. Because again, the sad part is that I lost my dad, but I got my brother back. And the great part of all of this 
is that in the family of God, we get both. We get both because what I learned in 2018 and again this week while preparing this message and while reconsidering my short-sighted, wholly emotional opinion about this parable is that when we come to the Father, not to use him, but to, to love him, we end up together. We end up with him. We end up with each other forever. When we come to the Father, when we run to him, when we go into the party, we end up together. And so by ending this story with an invitation to the older son to come inside, Jesus welcomes the Pharisees and the elder brothers in all of us to leave the land of our striving and our judging and our anger for the fullness of his feast, to step out of the shadows of our self-righteousness and into the light of his celebration where we are all welcome, not because we did everything right, but because he did right by us, among us, and for us, for all of us. Let's pray. God, thank you for speaking to us, to all of us, like you did to the folks who thought they were too far gone to come to you. And just like to the folks who thought they were too far ahead to even need you. Lord, both of these spirits live within each of us all the time. And you know that. As our Father, you know. You know what we need to hear. And your message is always the same. You love us. You died for us. You forgave us. And yeah, it doesn't seem fair. It seems reckless. Because it is. But that is our great gift that we get to receive when we hear your mercy calling out and we say, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to drop it all. I'm going to lay down my burdens. I'm going to lay down all this stuff that has been junking up my heart. I'm just going to go inside and see. I'm going to go inside and see what you have, not just for me, for my family, for my community, for my enemies. I'm going to step into that light, and I pray that, that we will all do that today, Lord, that we will come inside, whatever that looks like, that we will stop blaming people, looking down on people, and shaming people, and fearing, feeling superior to people, that we would draw near to you, and in doing so, see that we're all the same. We're all in need of your grace. We're all in need of your love. We're all in need of something we can't do on our own, which is to be with you forever. So I thank you, God, for the grace that allows us to come to your word, even when we don't like what it has to say and how you just carry us along and you teach us what you want us to hear gently, lovingly for as long as we need to hear it Lord and so I pray for everyone in this room that if this message hit them hard today that they would find a soft landing place in your arms in your love